go through rooms, through doors, or everything. If you have a lead bullet, it's going to be much Right, when you're looking at the Constitution, though, we got to look at what's the minimum. Can there be reasonable restrictions on the right to keep and bear arms? The answer is yes. The minimum is only that you can use a weapon for self-defense, particularly in the home. I don't think it's necessary that you have lead bullets. Okay, we have a question back here. Yeah. yeah. In, in light of the, the recent debacle in New York where a newspaper was allowed to get and publish the names and addresses of all those that held a concealed weapon permit, they went to another county in New York, as I understand it, and they were not given the records by the clerk. Do we really have any protections from that, or is, does it come down to the discretion of a clerk? I don't know the answer to that. I think it just varies state by state. As far as the Constitution goes, you're not protected. The Constitution, well, let's see. Does the Constitution have a privacy right in it? Hmm, I don't know. Um, the answer is maybe. Uh, but is, is, your, is, your, is your personal information, like whether you have a gun permit or not, constitutionally protected? Nah. But the state legislatures, they, they might protect you from now. Okay, so hypothetically, if uh, you get the American rifle and the American Hunter or any other gun magazine and they decide they're going to have a database and intimidate you, right, national da database, and you get a note in the mail, you know, you, if you take these magazines, you must have a, a gun in your house and we're going to come and harass you, you see. Or, you know, they're going to go to the states and say, oh, you have a gun permit because, you know, we got your name through the county and that we're going to harass you. You see, that's where they're going to try and go to. That's what I think because it's the administration that's now in power. Right, the old theory about the gun database and it would make it easier for the government to seize your guns, of course. And I saw the movie Red Dawn also, right? The Russians came in and they looked at the list that the local sheriff had, of all the guys that had guns, and then they went and shot all those guys or took their guns. Well, the thing I would like to say to you, though, is actually, yes, of course, that's true. It's common sense. If the government knows who owns the guns and the government wants to go get guns, then that list would be a useful piece of information to have. But here's the thing. In today's world, if you're worried about the government having a database of gun ownership, you've got so many more things to worry about. The NSA has databases on everybody for everything. They have stored every single email that everyone in this room has ever written, okay? The federal government has electronic data on everyone in here to the extent that was unimaginable before 9-11, certainly unimaginable back when gun control first became a hot topic in the 70s and 80s. The NSA can turn on my cell phone, even with the power off, turn on a microphone, listen to what I'm saying. These, this is true, you know. Uh, yeah, I'm a real subversive right now. Um, but if you're worried about government surveillance and government knowing about you, Gun database is minor. It's a lot worse than that. Go ahead, Andrew. I just wanted to mention in response to the question about the, um, the uh, records requests and getting lists of people who have concealed carry permits and things like that, those types of records are going to be issued by a, a government entity. And so in Washington, we have a Public Records Act that says Typically, any person can go in and make a request for specific information that's held um, by any government agency as a public record. There is an exemption in that for what's called personal information, and there are several um, specific types of personal information that can be included, um, specific identifiers, addresses, things of that nature, generally speaking, are not supposed to be disclosed. The question there really, though, is, 
how are you going to find out about it in time to be able to stop it? If you have somebody from a, an advocacy group that really wants the information, makes the request, it's not a public thing. It's just something that the receiving agency knows about and processes. So if they were to inadvertently release it or perhaps not, um, not really pay close attention to the personal information exemption or things like that, it's certainly possible that that kind of thing could be disclosed. So the answer to that really is, as I think is a common theme for the Tea Party, is just use your common sense in selecting your public officials. have a question Yeah, Jeff. I have heard talk about President Obama asserting his executive privilege on this issue, and I'm wondering how that fits into our right. Well, we have the three branches of government, the judicial, legislative, and the executive. And back in the 1700s, the executive was very weak. The executive has certain powers, foreign relations, commander-in-chief, and the vested executive which also known as the take care clause. The Constitution says that the president shall take care that the laws are faithfully executed. Uh -huh. That used to be all it was. Well, uh, you know, Andrea is a real expert on delegation. Uh, but what happened was Congress, uh, I guess probably in the 30s, that's a good guess because that's when a lot of things started going wrong. But Congress started doing something called delegation where they would say, well, here's the policy, here's the change that we want to happen, but we're not going to actually write the law. We're just going to delegate this assignment to the executive. Executive, you go out and write a regulation. And so now the executive branch, they write these regulations, and those regulations are, in theory at least, to put in place the will of the Congress, which also, in theory, is the will of the people. But that has really run rampant, and now we live in an administrative state where Barack Obama is the chief executive of by far the largest organization in human history. Okay, and what is that, 1.8 million employees? It's a behemoth. They have the administrative agencies covering every aspect of human activity. And what that has come down to is that the executive branch and the, and the chief executive, the president, has massive power over a ton of different areas of human life. And guns is one of them, ammunition is another. So if the president says, well, I'm going to uh, put forward my executive authority to make my will happen, no matter what Congress does. As far as the Constitution goes, he's not really supposed to do that. But as far as reality goes, yep, he can. Because we live in an administrative state. The executive branch has taken on so many more powers and responsibilities than it had in 1780. That the, that's why they use the term the imperial presidency. And, you know, uh, when it was George W. Bush, that was a bad thing. He was an imperial president. When it's uh, Barack Obama, well, I guess it's not as bad of a thing, you know, because he's a good guy and all that. But uh, both of them, they, the, the executive has taken a lot of power that used to lie in Congress. So can Barack Obama institute the assault weapons ban on his own? Yes. Not in the exact same form. It wouldn't be a law of Congress. But he can do things like say, well, um, taxes are higher on certain guns, or the Commerce Department's not going to allow some of them to cross state lines, or you might need a licensing requirement, all kinds of stuff. If your question is, does the executive branch have the power to do something, the answer is yes, they do. Next question. Hi, Jeff. Hi. Um, Interesting thing I heard on the news this morning, uh, 360 people were murdered with guns last year and 420 some odd were murdered with hammers and blunt, like bats. Yeah. I've never, ha never had to register my hammer. <laughs> but your, I, I will have a question at the end of this, but a little history. You're from West Virginia and my family's uh, Eastern Ohio, Marion County, just across the river. Very hillbilly. 
Um, a lot of thick undergrowth, a lot of stills. That sounded like some pride. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a lot of moonshine. But uh, the history is uh, 1934. You, you said earlier that 200 years we're still debating this. Well, not really. We're really just coming in the last maybe 50, 60 years debating this. Um, 1934 prohibition ended and we had all these federal agents that didn't have anything to do anymore, so we turned our focus on guns. Well, and I'm not gonna remember the names of the state, and I can get these for you if anybody would like, but a sawed-off shotgun was, and at that time, a common used item in a vehicle. It was normal throw in your pickup. Well, these two federal agents decided that that wasn't, uh, wasn't something that should be happening. Uh, arrested two men, they went to court. Uh, the judge in the, in the lawsuit decided that these federal agents were way beyond their bounds. He um, harshly um, um, chastised them for even bringing this suit, suit to, his, to his court in the state. Well, hillbillies went home, they're doing their thing. They never get the message that uh, these federal agents took it to Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, well, these guys never showed up. Apparently they couldn't be contacted. And so that's when the sawed-off shotgun was banned. And these laws keep creeping. They keep creeping and creeping and creeping over the years. And, you know, we're, we're here today because, um, oh, yeah, exactly. But the thing is, and the, and the question I have to go to, we talk about self-defense and hunting and all that with these guns. Uh, there was never a question. There used to be some common sense. There was never a question when, the, when our Constitution was written and when the Second Amendment was written. There was never any question about your right to defend yourself. There was not a question about whether you could go hunt a deer. So why was the Second Amendment written? Why was the First Amendment written? There are rights, and our rights against the government. So if we have the right to say what we want, as I do right now, and then I have the right to protect that, what was the Second Amendment written for, Jeff? Well, remember, the entire Bill of Rights, there was a big debate about whether the Bill of Rights was even necessary. Okay, there was one group that was like, well, we don't need the Bill of Rights to say that Congress can't pass a law abridging the freedom of the press. We don't need a Bill of Rights to say that uh, unreasonable search and the seizures aren't allowed. We don't need that because it's obvious. Because the Constitution does not grant Congress the power to establish, say, a national church. The Constitution does not grant Congress the ability to restrict firearm use, stuff like that. So a lot of people thought, well, the Bill of Rights isn't necessary because it's just obvious the government doesn't have that power. It's just going to overkill. Well, boy, were those guys wrong, huh? We are so glad that we have that Bill of Rights. <laughs> So I think that's one answer to your question. Why do we have the Bill of Rights? Well, I think the one answer is at that time, a lot of people thought that it was really important to enshrine these individual rights, even though at the time they were obvious. It was obvious that in 